very happy to introduce the next talk, which joins two topics I find quite interesting. For one thing, machine learning, in particular deep learning, and for the other thing, sustainability and how this can be connected. And if probably the deep learning hype is probably quite enlarged, which Nadja Geisler, Geisler and Benjamin Hedash will discuss for us. So let me stop talking here. Let's enjoy this talk. Give a warm welcome to Nadja Geisler and Benjamin Hedash. Ja, herzlichen Dank. Hallo erstmal. Hi. Schön, dass wir hier sein können. Schön, dass ihr alle hier seid. Wir very nice that we can be here and we're very excited to talk about this uh, on our very first Congress, actually. Uh, I'm Nadja uh, and I just finished the master, my master studies at the TU Darmstadt uh, and will probably start my PhD studies there. Um, I'm doing this for two years, uh, I'm Benjamin, and I ju don't just want to think about how exciting deep learning is and how to apply it, but instead uh, want to talk about its implications. This talk came about by the topic of the 3063 with sustainability, and so we always find it exciting to see how machine learning and deep learning inter uh, interfaces with sustainability. So, uh, that's exactly what we were already busy doing, because sustainability is currently, uh, yeah, just very topical and exciting. So, before we talk about three, the, the three different layers of sustainability, let's talk about the societal and environmental environmental impact. Of course, we first have to talk about what actually do we mean by deep learning in these next 45 minutes in this talk. What do you need to know so we can get you along in this talk? How does it work on an intuitive level, not so much on a detailed technical level? and how is it used currently. So when we're talking about deep learning, we primarily mean this uh, construction of neural nets, artificial neural networks. These are machine learning constructs, which existed for quite a, quite a while, and then interest in them dropped quite a bit because they didn't have the applications that one uh, was hoping for, and currently they're actually um, Again, hyped and quite in quite a lot of use. So we're talking about lots of connections between different nodes, uh, and they can be connected with different mathematical functions. And each of these uh, only represents a nonlinear uh, application function. So, and once the weights between these uh, calculations have been trained completely, then each numerical input into this net. Uh, gives you a specified output, and this might give you classifications, uh, weightings, whatever. Which means for neural nets, the most uh, non-trivial uh, implication is that we need lots of labeled data. Uh, uh, so usually, if you're working with neural nets, you need lots and lots of data. They need to be very diverse, should really represent your reality, uh, whatever that means. And like that, you're training the model. So we're seeing quite well in this case, uh, reading from left to right, you're having input data which might be in some format, which we will not discuss today. These are going into the neurons, the nodes, and each of these nodes represents some specific feature. So in image recognition, this might be an edge uh, or a curve. Uh, the further you get into the neural net, uh, it will represent more composite and more complex properties. And the trouble is, usually we don't know quite well what the neural net is actually learning. So we find an image classifier which can distinguish dogs and wolves, but we cannot look into the neurons and see, okay, this neuron classifies uh, what the tail looks like. That's not how it works usually. So we have black box models, and in detail, we don't really know what we actually learned in the neural net. 
so we don't know how the output actually comes from the input. But this uh, is the basis for all systems uh, which we usually talk about when we mean deep learning. So what we have in this case is we use math, lots and lots of data, and use a few tricks from statistics. So we use that when we look at things often enough, then there is some system in them, and if you uh, look at them often enough, you will find the system, so it will generalize. So this uses tricks, which we know for hundreds of years in statistics, and these are applied to get from a heap of data, which we don't really understand, and just use this, the fact that it's lots of data to generate some generalization and systematization of this data. At least that's the optimistic upshot. So this has, though it's called deep learning, the implication, so it sounds like intelligence and artificial intelligence, so it won't really represent what you think of when you think intelligence. Uh, and this here summarizes it quite well. And it usually, yeah, people usually say the human brain works on habit and conditioning much faster. So we don't usually need to be hit 200 times in the face to learn that we don't like that. <laughs> but if we show a neural net 200 dogs and 200 wolves, the system will not have learned to distinguish them so far because that it won't learn from context as the human brain does. So human brain does different things to get a decision. So we will talk to about that in more detail later. But the problem is we just go for mass of data and we cannot reach the... Um, can not be as precise as we want to. And originally the plan was to rebuild the brain because we have neurons that fire and um, it kind of was the idea, but that's not how neural networks work to die. Um, we don't rebuild brains. It was just the original idea. So the interesting part for us is how do we apply this technology? We don't see this technology only in research or in universities, but the technology is very far distributed and we see it everywhere. Um, after this bigger drought we talked about earlier, um, this technology has quite a high at the moment and there's really a lot possible at the moment. So there's speech assistants, Siri, Amazon, they need to know how um, speech recognition and text and they have to um, process information from this huge information cluster. But there's also companies like Tesla and Uber and through them there's like a lot of distribution of autonomous driving and they have to work with um, image recognition and stuff like that. Um, and so if you think about that, it's quite easy to see um, that there's lots of those recommendation systems in everyday life um, that generate recommendations like Google and Amazon and um, you have like those rankings and there's also the question, what do I get to see? What does my Facebook page show me? Who gets to see what? And that's not as straightforward as um, many people think. Um, a lot less known is like systems like um, uh, systems that do um, scoring for um, legal reasons um, or face recognition, um, identifying people. Uh, there's also scoring algorithms for some social systems, for example, for insurances. 
and also um, application can be happening by those neural networks without any person looking at your application. And these systems, again, work in a way that we don't really understand what's happening. We actually don't understand what's happening. Uh, for example, face recognition or those application systems, there will be a five-second video analyzation and the system will do quite a lot like measuring um, distance between eyes and nose and then it might find s it kind of looks like Und solche Dinge genetics in systemen heutzutage eingesetzt nicht unbedingt absichtlich aber man wenn man the systems are applied today and stellt man plötzlich mit mit großen bedauern fest and if you actually look at them precisely in more detail and look what they are actually doing it, there's quite a lot going on and there's actually a lot of disadvantages and they are um, biased and it's getting more genug dazu was wir unter deep learning verstehen und was angewendet wird um, and so now we want to talk about scientific um, okay. scientific sustainability. So uh, we want to check how relevant is the topic that we do, how relevant are the results that we have for the uh, field of study that we have and for the everyday life of people. So we also questioning, can we reproduce these results at all? Can anyone uh, reading this paper um, really reproduce the data or even at, uh, get at the scale of data? So do we have uh, published enough detail and are the results as valid to make these things possible? So. And can we reuse things that we produce in size, or are they only just a one-trick pony for that one very thing? So, um, also, are they competitive? Um, are there some systems that uh, that are better with less effort? So, and we would like to check with uh, what systems thinking is behind the system. How did we research what is useful or not useful? And finally, um, what's the validity? What's the impact? Uh, of the things that we have as a result there. So is it relevant, is it statistically significant what we produce there? So, well, <coughs> at this point, um, we let's have a look. So, I mean, some of you might be might work in uh, science, some from industry, but it doesn't matter. So how would we wish that science would work? So very systematically, so people think about things, they test things, and they see they work, and then it's fine. But in reality, it's very, very common that we have a completely different model behind there. So there are publications about some uh, about how the neural networks work and how to uh, how to design them, how to make the data flow. People think about some things, they publish it, and other things, other people think, well, that sounds interesting. Let's just take this and build something for my use case, uh, build a new system. So they just take a model that they heard somewhere that uh, just was po um, was popular in, in sciences, and they think, okay, how could we use that? How can we take it? And yes, well, I just put a couple of layers of those uh, behind each other. Let's say um, uh, just some ballpark number. And now let's let's use a couple of dimensions for our vector. They did just make it up. It, it sounds plausible. Then they look at the, the data. You beat the data as long as they uh, until they fit into the model. Then you do some numerical computing on them, and finally. Um, you put it into the network, and then it's called deep learning because it's an, that means now the learning starts. So you push, push the data into the system, see how it fits, how good is the prediction, and um, looking at that, then you refit the system, you edit the system, and you try and try again until uh, you have uh, you do some weighting in the functions, and then you have uh, basically. Um, 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 have ma a made up model that fits your use case. If the numbers look quite good on the data you put into that, then people say, yeah, well, okay, let's put this into the paper. 
And, and they say, okay, for the classification of wolves against dogs, we have this architecture and those data, and these are the numbers. Uh, here you are, this is our great new research result. If the data don't look as good, they say, um, well, I probably used just the wrong system that someone used. Uh, maybe I have a neural layer too little or wrong dimensions. Well, okay, then I just start again with some arbitrary thing. It's uh, just uh, power and time. And so I let my GPUs run and run and run until they heat up. And I start just, just start over and see if this time the numbers are right. And well, um, depending on how this uh, works, you either say, okay, I use it or I do it again. And in addition, if you look at it, it's, it's not really a scientific, it's not even empiric, it's just try and error, hoping for something good to come out of this. But after that, um, you can use those beautifications, fairy dust methods that we have in science, and these are that are hard to track for people who are not insiders. So, for example, you just show the results where the data fit. And then the second data sit where the numbers don't fit as well, and they don't work as much. Well, I just don't publish those. I just keep them in my drawer. And, and my numbers that look good, I just publish those. And someone just has to replicate those data and make those numbers look as nice as they are. So. Um, and in many fields of study, this is something that happens. If you publish um, a paper at the prestigious conference with a minimal um, extension to the state of the art, that's um, already something people are proud of. But um, what you also can do is you can just repeat experiments and have the mean of those experiments. You also can use that very experiment where you had the best score and just publish that. And there's other tricks uh, in those. Uh, so we, we, we already have a bad process that is uh, misused to get better looking results in a much shorter time and to publish those. And that's what we see a lot in the deep learning field of study. Not in all papers, um, the fundamental papers are pretty well, but a lot of application papers are actually Really, I mean, the way they are made, uh, they don't have any additional value or only relevance to actual research. This thing is obviously written in a very uh, marketing kind of way to uh, uh, emphasize this a lot. So just imagine there's this field with such pressure and so many reasons for stuff to fail uh, or for, on the other hand, to beautify yourself, uh, then you will obviously use this. Obviously, we see it's uh, deep learning is particularly uh, exposed to these uh, tricks. For one thing, so, so there is research to understand these black box models uh, and understand why they work the way they do, but if you think of these as black box models, it's obviously making it more exposed for such tricks. So, the data is processed in some way and it's going into the system and then they are post-processed and then you have to decide what's actually true, is this true enough, is this okay to publish in my paper. So, what they actually measured will probably not be in the paper, so this is actually where you can fudge a few things and to get it into your paper. So, because uh, there's a, a huge demand for experts in this field, uh, it's actually quite easy to get through with uh, methods like this. On the other hand, if you want to get the good jobs, you need to have publications like this, so there's a demand for such publications. And there's lots of low-hanging fruit in uh, this field. So you don't need to have much of, an uh, much of good ideas, much of brilliant or new ideas, so you can build something uh, quite easily accessible uh, and you just happen to be the first one, so you don't need to prove yourself in comparison to anyone else, you just show I'm the first one to do this with acceptable results, so you're the first person to do this and then you can publish. 
So that's why many people want to publish lots of things quickly uh, in these fields. So when we look into into, uh, into how good a system is which was presented, then it would be nice if we could re, uh, just reproduce the experiments. That's actually, sadly, not as trivial as you might think. So even if the systems which are used are usually quite standardized and usually open source, that's typically not true for all the details and modifications the people who published the paper have used. This will probably not be true. So you will probably not have access to the evaluation. Typically, you won't have access to the data because this is usually quite precious to have, so you don't want to give it. Uh, publicly, but that's on the other hand not the way science is supposed to work. You can just uh, you can't just give your system, but not give the data. Uh, my system is just excellent. Uh, I can't give you the data to prove it. In these systems, uh, there's loads of hyperparameters which you firstly usually guess, uh, and then you just do trial and error. And if you don't know these hyperparameters, you have actually no no shot at uh, rebuilding this uh, system. You don't know with what separation of the data this has happened, uh, so you don't have a chance how to build the system. But we need all these exact uh, exact values to build these systems because they are actually quite fragile with regards to these parameters. So if you just change a bit of the things about these uh, chain functions there, you get bad results and you're not sure if it's because of the, the original bad publication or if it's you building the wrong thing. Currently there's a few uh, streams uh, to make this uh, the duty of the research is to publish uh, things along with this but yeah there's nothing forcing them to do that but it's not obligatory to do so so imagine you want to have a seal to say my paper is reproducible then you have to um, give all this uh, which we have on the slide so code data hyperparameters the random initialization the sequence and the grouping of data uh, but you can just not do it so this is obviously a uh, position where you want to have a discussion because, yeah, it would be good if we had this on all papers. So the effect of all this is we have lots of research which cannot be used by other people. So others have to repeat this research. And additionally, through this effect and the pressure of publish or perish, research will just be published with only minimal optimizations. So this system is better than 0.005% than the reference system, uh, and this will be another paper. So we might wish for having reproducibility everywhere. So the most important thing, whenever we're sitting in such... <laughs> whenever we're sitting in such uh, publicity... Uh, we need to assure reducibility. But, but now look, a squirrel. <laughs> so that's something that's happening quite often because researchers, even if they want to publish their source code, they might just not have the time. They haven't cleaned up their code by the timeline um, because the pressure to publish is so high. Um, it's raising exponential. You have to be faster to be state of the art. Um, to bring your own improvements onto the market. So there's working, um, the working quality doesn't improve with that. Um, so then I have code that's quite messy and then there would be much work involved to clean this code up to publish it. 
and <laughs> so everything else is more interesting than making this code accessible for everyone. Um, so of course that's not happening everywhere, there's people who actually try to do that and put work into that, but it's quite rare. And so there was research, um, this reproducibility challenge. Um, there were researchers who were asked to look for one paper from 2018 or 2019 and to reproduce all the outcomes. And they were asked to, um, the authors were asked to publish their code and then other researchers were asked to reproduce this work and the code. Um, and here the success rate, so there is at least uh, uh, 30% of reproducible work and 54% um, of somewhat reproducible work and then there's also the part of um, the difficulty. So there's like reasonable difficulty but if it's very difficult to um, rebuild this code, it might not be worth the effort. And so with at least 20% of the papers, it was really hard to reproduce um, the outcome. And it was very easy only with a really small percentage. And the question was, do we have a reproducibility crisis in machine learning? And people were asked whether they have a problem with this, if they think there's a problem. And just by doing this research, um, the asked researchers answered 15% more likely that there is a problem. Noch ein Beispiel. Um, Another example. Das ist jetzt, es gibt tatsächlich inzwischen Paper. So there are papers, actually, <laughs> with, which are dealing with the question how reproducible are other papers. Um, so they're giving recommendations, or like they're looking for the top end recommendations. So there were 18 publications from on deep learning on big conferences and people looked at them and looked how many of them can we reproduce. Uh, we asked the authors whether they can give us the code, ask again, uh, try to make it work, try to work with similar hardware and rebuild those systems. And so for this example, from 18 paper, they could reproduce seven papers. So for those seven papers, they can rebuild everything and come to a similar conclusion. But important only after they worked on it, after they asked for it, after they put in the work to ask and rebuild it. And that's not a standard. So normally if I just publish a paper on a conference, then people just read that paper and maybe they look, watch a video and maybe there's some additional data, but normally people only read this paper. There's eight, ten, maybe twelve pages, and then the people only decide with this text, only with the numbers in the text the authors gave, um, and then people decide whether this work is relevant, important, usable, and then there is a decision whether that paper is published or not. But there's, people cannot actually test whether that's right or not. They have to trust the text. That's the standard. If we don't explicitly try to reproduce those papers or ask for reproducibility on those great con big conferences. And there's not one of those big conferences that really um, require reproducibility. Um, it's just like uh, optional requirement and the reviewing process is without actually reproducing the work. And to make it a bit more demotivational, uh, out of those seven outcomes they could reproduce, uh, they used non deep learning processes and compared them to those outcomes and 
for out of six of those seven, and six of out of those seven um, cases, they actually had similar outcomes um, with other uh, pro procedures. So only one paper had a significant better outcome with using deep learning that could repro be reproduced. So, <laughs> deep learning is a word that makes a lot of hype, so as you can see, there's lots of people here. So, there's kind of like the thing, oh yeah, we have baselines and I just have to give something that's a bit better. Uh, so, I'm not trying to actually make other systems look better because then my system might look worse. Uh, so there's not actually a lot, lot of research in this special area deep learning, but not in the other areas because there could actually be a lot of, um, of much research we can actually gain from that and much betterment, but we only think of them as baselines and because I have to quite of show that my system is a bit better. So a baseline might be um, a coin toss, like 50-50. So when I want to show my system is better than that, then 50-50, so if it, my system is worse, then it's not better than the baseline, but if my new system is better than 50-50, so it's better than the baseline coin toss. So maybe it m would be better to compare it to something other, something better than just coin toss, but of course then my system has it harder to be look good. So here's some challenges where everyone can kind of work with. So these are kind of uh, challenges where people can actually take something that works and it's a bit different than research and with deep learning there's like a lot of stuff that works that we can compare to and but we see that also classic approaches have here quite a huge part of it, more than on normal conferences. So if I actually want something that works and I don't want to use that much effort, and then deep learning is actually not the go-to system. Okay, so the next aspect we would like to talk about is the uh, um, effects it has on society. So what we do know is uh, that we have to look at sustainability. So especially the uh, how can I explain something and how transparency. So if there's a system uh, that does uh, that decides on matters of, li of life and that, can I actually understand the system as a human? So um, there is a system that scores people, how, that scores criminals, are they going to commit criminal offenses again? And judges are actually using the system to decide upon the penalty that people uh, get. So if we look at the skin color of people who get these scores and we see that we have a huge difference between uh, white and black people, so in the upper left, we say higher and lower scores are um, equally distributed. While we see with uh, with people with white skin or people who are perceived as being white, we see uh, that the lower scores are much, much higher. So, and we have seen that this is actually um, not true in reality. So that um, we have for the for the same crime, we have different different penalties and judges, and so it's not fair. So people who work in this area have looked at it and have said, okay, so it should have been actually a reverse distribution, reverse to what we see here, and so. We see matters decided that uh, matters of life and that is deciding here. No one can understand how the score comes about. So the company says, well, uh, the background or the color of the skin of those people it has not entered this data. But in USA, it's correlated to so much to, to income and to all other factors. So it's not even um, a significant fact whether they have uh, looked at the color, color of skin there. So the other thing is... Um, what is um, what is uh, unique um, 
um, suggestion how to handle things. So people call something an algorithm, but we have to have a critical view on those systems that are decision they do uh, that make decisions for us. So is deep learning a thing that we should uh, call something that is a decision making system because it's a lot of there's a lot of random data there's a lot of statistics in there and it's more like a mach machine gut feeling that makes those decisions and is it something we would actually want to rely upon as a society so what we actually see is a huge generalization so we take data points from the past that we know about and then we apply them, we train them, and then we hope that actually if we generalize them enough and we try as hard as we can uh, with the system and the system has to produce a result and it will produce a result. Um, whether it sees a good reason for that result or not, they try to find a pattern and then they produce a result. And that's what we have. And so um, that what uh, people say, well, the artificial intelligence is prediction something or it's thinking about something. It's nothing. It's just learning from past data. It's a generalization and spitting this out as a result. So if we talk about prediction, um, there is we don't think about the future. We are thinking about the past. And so this is a question whether we can actually project things, whether we can make predictions from the data we have. Um, another problem is that people... Um, trust computing systems. Well, probably not all the people in this room, which is a nice thing to have, but in society, it's a very prevalent thing. AI is great. AI is going to save us. AI can do things that we cannot do. And we have some examples here. So there is this giant initiative. Everything, ha Everyone has to do AI. If there's AI in the application, then... It's uh, I get the, the funding. If I even write um, AI on my cosmetics, I can sell them better. It's done by AI. So even if I present my company um, um, as AI savvy, it might even be good um, hiring people pretending to be computers because computers cannot do this today and doing a restaurant reservation or something like this. So we can say, well, our own AI systems are so great and so powerful um, because it's not a human, it's a computer which is much wiser um, and then you can even gain get a sort of business advantage. A very disconcerning uh, uh, thing we have here ねえ、起きてってば。おはよう。おはよう。あ、今日雨が降るかもしれないから傘持って行って。急がないと遅刻しちゃうよ。行ってきます。行ってらっしゃい。気をつけてね。
Well, to answer the question, yes, that's real. That's an actual real thing. And I hope I don't have to explain why this is really, really worrying. So what's happening with people from a social perspective if we interact with machines as if there were people, as if they had feelings, as if they imitate patterns that we have in relationships, what happens to us, what is going to happen, how much bias that we don't have are we going to accept? To get to another topic, and I hope we only have to uh, get into this for a short time because I have no, no answer to this uh, question. I don't need to explain to you why uh, avoiding data collection is uh, a good thing, but with deep learning the trouble is we need lots and lots of data and this is obviously in big conflict uh, with our interest to not uh, save data. And other people have probably, uh, you probably have mostly seen this, this uh, chatbot uh, on Twitter which learned within a day to uh, give extremely racist uh, statements of its own. So we might not want to have artificial intelligence actually imitate people. And another thing we need to discuss, which is relevant for us all, where we're all working in, on systems which are supposed to move something in the world, who is responsible? A very typical uh, example for this is autonomous cars. Who is responsible if an accident happens? But this is true for so many other systems. There are so many uh, positions which might be responsible for this. There's people who marketed this, there's people who programmed this, there's people who talked about the regulation, uh, who devised the regulations, there's the insurances. Uh, and then people who might have had another car with another autonomous system, who is the responsible one in this chain of responsibilities? So whosoever might be the one who might be liable for this, this might give you another chain of responsibilities and insurances on how you're going about this. And there's no satisfying answer to this yet. There has been a survey among uh, US adults who said the majority find it unacceptable in some sectors, so for one thing, to, uh, for criminal risk assessment, or maybe the resume screening, uh, but it, it's quite unfortunate that this is actually stuff that's already happening uh, and it's a growing sector. As a third topic, let's discuss the... An uh, yeah, this is the third point that's uh, uh, usually carried with negligence. We said that about all positions, but this is true about the environmental impacts of deep learning as well. So this is a topic where we have to talk, which we have to talk about, even though it might not concern us on the first view. So you are aware about cryptocurrencies and how they have a high uh, power usage. So a typical Bitcoin transaction uses as much current as 500,000 Visa transactions do. So this uh, is the power consumption for a refrigerator for eight years uh, for one transaction in Bitcoin. We also have the general uh, problem, deep learning needs lots of data, everywhere we need lots of data, we need to transport this data somehow, and this globally uh, increases the, the number of service centers, and this uh, yields to something like 200 to 500 billion kilowatt hours per year. It's not as easy to uh, exactly quantify this, apparently, but uh, probably if you were to think of these server farms as, uh, as countries, then there's only five countries which actually use more power than these two. If we look 
much on a much smaller scale into the training process of individual models, then there's actually quite a whole, quite a high power consumption, which is uh, actually scary. Uh, it's not linearly increasing; it's actually also scaling probably exponentially. And then you see the big state-of-the-art systems. Uh, usually coming from Google and Facebook and other research institutes and yeah, big companies, then they use uh, energy for hundreds and thousands uh, sometimes even millions of uh, euros because they're using GPUs and TPUs which are hard to get, uh, which are expensive to get. So by energy consumption, uh, and with these chips, and with only few companies doing all this, uh, and only being able to do all this to be a state of the art, so this has societal impact, this obviously has the environmental impact and the power consumption, uh, and it's a trend in the absolutely wrong direction. If you're looking into the CO2 equivalents uh, of this, then we see that the training of one model, which is published, this uses as much uh, CO2 as five cars, including their production and all their fuel, fuel during their lifetime. And this is still happening uh, for publishing because people want to publish. So on a grand scale, we're still publishing a new publication with just a minute increase um, uh, with this carbon. And now I'm giving you the happy news. Yeah, just joke, but still. It's about Google. They tried to use machine learning to optimize their data centers. Get, uh, get it to uh, decrease its energy consumption with re reinforcement learning, in case you know what that is. And they uh, dropped their energy consumption by about 40%. That's good news. Uh, and yes, I'm aware of the irony that we're talking about a uh, decrease in energy consumption of a data center which might not exist if we didn't have this discipline. But still, we, might, uh, we can use this uh, for our advantage. So this might not be applicable to all energy and carbon uh, relevant industries. This might be very problematic for car production processes. We cannot just uh, exchange whisk task is done when. So when the factory is not in use or so, this might not be workable, but it is something we need to think about. With energy and CO2, that's not the end of the line of this discussion. It's also about infrastructure and how do we use that for building, for transport, for network. It's about what kind of space do we need to build those server farms and for the production of CPU and about working uh, force and resource, um, research resource and our world's resources like metal and um, oil and there's so much more resources we need for this and it's not just energy and awareness on this point is way too low to actually make um, good statements about this. And so here we are at the questions, how actually can we go on? So important, it's really important that we all are responsible. Um, the people who do the research, who build the systems, we are um, the ones in charge of um, building the systems and that those systems are actually built. And um, we are responsible to make them easier and more generalized. 
irgendwelche 25 Gigabyte pro Stunde an Daten produzieren. And dann wieder if we build systems into kann, cars that das, use 25 gigabytes of data transfer or something like that, and we built stuff for industry, and, and then there's usage for KI in skincare products, and of course you can do that, and you can earn a lot of money in those in this sector, and but it's not a good idea, and everyone should actually think about what are the consequences, and what do we need to change to actually further this field? And it's the nice thing in research. It's community, and everything is driven by the community. It's every researcher can decide what they want to do, if they want to go on in this way, or if they want to um, put more effort into those things, especially for the society, um, we have to have discourse, we have to talk with broad part of society about what do we want, what do we think is acceptable and what not, which um, decisions have to be taken. It's just not a decision of five people, but of the whole society, and it's not an easy thing, and there's not a clear answer, so we have to talk about this. Uh, we have to further this discussion on all layer, like on all fields, on all parts of society. I have to talk to users. A user should know what it means to use a system. What are the of consequences of using a system and everyone who uses those systems um, and the policy makers they have to know about the systems to actually can know to be able to know what is reasonable and what not so we have to talk about how our data work where our models are from about reproducibility about responsibility so in the end, we have to rethink instead of just follow. So we have to think about these things quite foundationally. We are not in a devil spiral. We can use the alternatives for deep learning. We can actually work with less and we can use less resources. So our biggest um, responsibility is now to talk to people, to work against the knowledge lack in the public eye. And thank you for your attention and we hope we gave you some new parts and now we have some time for questions. <laughs> but we are really glad if you inform yourself, if you do some research, if you come to us with some questions. Thank you. So while the applause is running, thanks for listening to the English translation of the deep learning hype. Um, your translators were Florian and please give us feedback. Um, email us at hello at c3lingo.org or use hashtag c3t on Twitter. And now for the Q&A. Okay, so first question. AI for cars is very fascinating. It decides between a tree and a traffic sign. I'm really disappointed if I look at AI for SEO, search engine optimization. Well, my question is, or what is the problem? I think it's the data. So if you look at a tree, it's a tree. Um, but if there's a website, what's the best website or what's the best video? That's uh, really a matter of taste. So what I would like to explain is, wouldn't it be much more useful or um, required to think about how training data, um, how, what's the qualitative level, or what's the qualitative ranking of training data? Um, yes, I, it's really important to have qualitative, high quality data. Um, but another problem is it's not really trivial. Um, it's 
ähm, trivial ist es. Also There's natürlich sind Suchmaschinen einfach auch eine subjektivere Entscheidung, weil was ich suche, um, weiß am Ende nur ich. So, of course, so search engines are not quite trivial, because what I'm looking for might not be the same thing as another person is looking for. And of course, there's like huge amounts of data in the web. There's quite a lot different and quite more data than was autonomous cars. Um, but especially like with so search engines, we have to talk about the data sets and the quality. So another question from the internet, should we leave the deep learning, should we let it go? Or is there like some implication that might be useful. Well, just letting it go, that's probably not the right thing to do. It's useful for a couple of things. So there's something where it works really well, um, especially if you look at very, very complex things, there's very little approaches that work as good. For example, language processing has made a huge step forward by deep learning because uh, human language is so complex that all other approaches that we have, like counting syllables, um, comparing letters that didn't help. I need a lot of knowledge that goes in there. And so I had to think about, is it, is it the right approach for the thing at hand? And well, I, I, want, I don't want to make it now an overall answer. You have to think about it case by case. Yes, that should be the message here. So we're not asking, should we use deep learning? We are asking, what are we using deep learning for? So I'm trying to do this somewhat chrono chronologically with the questions in the room. So one question about reproducibility. I was talking, uh, I was sitting in a lightning talk where someone was uh, talking about he could not reproduce uh, such results. His main idea was to yeah, just force people that they have to publish all this along with their paper. Is this something where you're seeing that's the right thing to do? Well, there are some certifications at conferences that we have. There's probably some at journals. Well, it depends on the field of study. So in some areas, there's not much publishing in journals because it's easier in conference. And it's much, much quicker because uh, journal publishing takes a long time. It's much slower. We would wish for having more of that. But I would say, well, the elders of research, I would call it, that uh, organize the conferences, they have to actively decide that's high on our priority list. They have to enforce it, and it's optional right now. So we would wish for it, definitely. And, well, we're also talking about regulations, and then there's uh, public-funded research and private research, and there's that's very, very different challenges. So let's now talk to microphone number seven. Hi, thanks for the talk. Are you thinking that general artificial general intelligence is something you can think of? Artificial general intelligence. Okay. Um, yes. Well, currently, hell no. Okay, that was not a professional answer. But uh, currently, we have very, very specialized expert systems that can do one detailed task, even in language assistance, language processing. Um, it's very, very restricted. So we have done some considerable process. But you can um, uh, you can uh, really break the system. So give me some system with three voice matches. I can break system. There's an American professor who actually does that. And we have very strong limitations. In the upcoming years, personally, I don't see it happening. Um, so, But it's something we have to keep an eye on. I wouldn't say there is no threat in that. And it's also not the, the, focus of the focal point, right? Right now, so people are working on expert system. They they're working on some systems uh, that actually decide which expert systems do I use. But the research to have a like a world understanding system which can give arbitrary answers. Um, I mean, there's interest in that, but that's nothing that re reflects in the current publications because we are not that far. And the expert systems are much easier to build. Um, and if you're interested in that, it's called semantic modeling uh, because uh, we have to model the, the, the common knowledge and model common knowledge, that's not there, so we have to work on that. 
nehmen wir noch eine Frage aus dem Internet. So, let's take another question from the Internet. I'm supposed to give you kind regards from D120. Uh, you might know better what that is. is. The question is, is reproducibility only trouble in deep learning or is that uh, more trouble in machine learning in general? Yes, it covers, uh, it's, it's a huge problem in almost every scientific publication. That's a huge factor. There's some who are more vulnerable to this and some are less vulnerable, but, it, but um, it's, it's not as widespread as we would like to use it. And this affects all of computer science. So everything we said here also affects uh, machine learning in general, but especially the deep learning because of the huge um, data amounts, then we have very, very strong effects um, of the things. Yeah, and well, since it's a buzzword right now, that makes it vulnerable at this point. Microphone number eight. So let me connect to this. I'm, I'm thinking this is very biased to the publication. Because they, they're playing with the data so long until they have a result. That's another trend in the psychology uh, where they had that massively. Uh, and they solved this by registering the publication into the journal before they know the results, so they might have a negative result. Are there such efforts in machine learning? Uh, so you're giving the corpus uh, of data before you uh, want to publish? Oh, that's a hard question to answer for that area, because I think it wouldn't work like that. So publish your data well, there's data conferences that are uh, specialized on this, but uh, you can do a lot of things on one corpus of data, and so that's not really helpful. I think that the question is much more complex here. I wouldn't know of any efforts in that direction. I mean, it would be nice. Yes, it would be nice to have, but uh, I think that's not being done right now. I have never encountered, or in the large conferences, no one ever uh, forced me to, to state beforehand what I think would be the result. Only if I have my results, I, would, uh, I will just um, publish that there. And if I have my, my mistakes and errors in the paper, no one is enforcing this. There are some approaches there, um, like encouraging uh, publishing failures, but a lot of people uh, just frown upon this and say, oh, wow, well, that's nothing we, are, we would like to deal with. And that has the effect on machine learning that people do not work systematically in machine learning. They just go with a gut feeling. And there's a typical sentence, well, it's understood that this doesn't work. Yeah, where do you know it from if you don't, uh, if you don't okay, check it? So we have time for only one short question. I'd like to know two things about this black box. Uh, so I know that you can look into the feature maps of this network and to investigate these. Uh, so I'm of the impression it's not as black. Well, that depends on how, how it works. So there's this approach of explainable neural nets. Um, and uh, that's being worked on, but there are architectures that are completely um, uh, ununderstandable for us. And the uh, the approaches to understand what's working there, there are these are approaches. They are there, but it's um, but they only check the model in there. But the, the whole pipeline of machine learning is much much longer. It starts with getting the data, selecting the data, processing the data. Um, selecting the features, doing the post-processing, doing the evalu evaluation matrix. And these are all things you can tinker with and uh, you have to understand these to explain the whole thing. And yes, there are approaches that work in their fields, okay, but that's it. Yes, and that's uh, the end of the talk. Um, um, thanks, Nadja and Benjamin.